Hey everybody, it's Porsche coming to you live from Prison from the Inside Out, Inc. This is the Dante Tay Kid story. He is writing out of North Carolina. His DOC number is 35174-007. A lot of you guys might realize that this story looks familiar. It's actually... Um, the organization's first story ever. So shout out to Dante Kid. He's the bomb. We're going to go right into it because this story is long, but it's interesting. All right, everyone. Page one. Hello, my name is Dante Kid. To those who know me more closely, I'm known as Tay. I guess my story begins as many of the Black men raised in the projects of Washington, D.C. Brought up with no father and only the neighborhood hoodlums and drug dealers to look up to Naturally, I was attracted to the street life. My mom was 15 when she gave birth to me. So in truth, she was just a girl trying to raise a child on her own. With her still growing into herself and making all the mistakes that teenagers make, it's an understatement when I say that I have saw and experienced things that no child should. Although that is an absolute fact, another fact is that I by no means blame my mom for my hardheadedness. Accountability. The bottom line is, I was always into one thing or another. I've done pretty much everything from stealing cars to selling drugs, and my juvenile jacket exists to validate the truth of these words. Fighting was almost a daily thing, seeing as I grew up in a lesbian household. In those days, being gay wasn't something that people um, openly accepted. I was born in 1982 and raised in the 90s. So naturally, as not only being the only child, but also the only male in my mother's household, I protected my mother's honor fiercely. Period. That's what I'm talking about. That's how we do too. So I understand. I get it. Page two. Kids were cruel in those days, and there were no bully laws or protection for children coming up back then. So I fought and refused to be bullied and did much of the things that I saw the older boys from the neighborhood do. As I thought this was how men were supposed to act and carry themselves. I've been jumped several times, shot and stabbed on a few different occasions. The whole time that I was going through this and basically participating in my own demise and the overall perpetuated devastated state of mind as a whole, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was doing wrong. How I knew? Because although my mom was preoccupied with her own maturing phase, she never failed to school me on the proper etiquette of how a young man was expected to carry himself. I was further raised to be a respectable young gentleman by my strong grandmother, who took me in for three years when my mom had gotten addicted to crack cocaine in like 89. Um, with my grandmother, this schooling was even more profound because she was and still is a devout Christian. Amen. With that said, it's safe to admit that I was a church going little nigga. That's what he said, y'all, not me. <laughs> For a while. <laughs> I say all that to drive home my point. That I was aware that the street life that I eventually led was wrong. The thing is, a kid can be told the difference between right and wrong. But if the same kid is constantly exposed to the wrong and people he's around and only sees on a daily basis, don't seem to be disgusted by this kind of behavior, then obviously they've accepted it as normal and this is how ultimately the child views his own behavior. That's really strong because basically what he's saying is that even though his conscience was telling him that he was wrong, his surroundings were not telling him that it was wrong. So it almost became his normal. And no one was saying, no, no, you shouldn't do it. So it was okay. All right, page three. Therefore, what I was told was wrong. As a child became an accepted wrong, and that was very close to being like right to my young, immature mind. I can truly say that children, teenagers, young adults, don't fully understand the gravity of their actions. That is until they grow up having to bear the consequences of those childhood mistakes on their shoulders. I am an example of this above statement. 
for my misled and immature decision to leave the street life allowed me to be placed in the wrong place and at the wrong time, which in turn allowed the dirty prosecutor representing the government for the DC Superior Court to accuse me and wrongly convict me for a murder that I did not commit. I am still fighting for my freedom and am at the very moment drafting issues to be presented to the appeals court. So I can only get so far into the, into the details of my case. But the gist of what I am incarcerated for is this, the prosecutor's theory. I, Dante Kidd, had an ongoing beef with the guy from the neighborhood, which came to a head when this same guy shot my vehicle with paintballs. The theory continued by alleging that there was a fight between me and the guy, which apparently I was on the losing end of. According to the prosecutor, I was in a rage over the loss of a physical altercation in my paintball car that I decided that I was going to kill this guy. I then allegedly recruited two unknown, unidentified men to help me execute my revenge. This revenge came in the unrealistic form of me by myself, quickly descending down on this man with a loaded weapon pointed at this man and holding him at bay for an undetermined amount of time until the two unknown unidentified males showed up, one of which who then committed the murder. We then all fled the scene of the crime. Page four. Now at the time of my initial incarceration, myself and my family lacked the funds to retain a paid attorney, like most people. So with no other choice in the matter, I had to go to trial with a court appointed attorney. Maybe if I would have saved some of the money that I had made in the streets, I would have been able to pay for an attorney, some type of legal representative who believed in my innocence. I had no one on my behalf who was capable of arguing that the prosecutor's star witness, who was proven to be an obvious liar and was proven to have a benefit for her testimony, had admitted in an affidavit that she had lied to the authorities about my involvement in the murder and that she had not actually even seen me on the scene at all that morning. Me not having effective counsel gave the judge the opportunity to instruct the jury that they did not have to find that I, a man who was charged with first degree murder, premeditating, deliberating, and intending the death of a person, that's what first degree murder is, intended to kill this man, an element of the crime that cannot be overlooked or admitted for without this key element, first degree premeditated murder would not even be an existing charge. The prosecutor lied, threatened, not only me, but defense and government witnesses. He manipulated and fabricated evidence against me. My trial lawyer was either extremely incompetent or clearly in cahoots with the prosecutor and the judge, which we all know happens. These motherfuckers are on the same team. Yeah, I said it. My court appointed attorney is now a judge. See, same thing. What makes matters worse, they supplied me with all the evidence that I have stated here and more. I have all of my trial transcripts, all of my discovery evidence, lawyers notes, that actually proved that the prosecutors clearly went after me. Just to say this, because I never say this, I actually have this man's paperwork. What he's saying is true. Page five, he selectively and vindictively prosecuted me, even though he knew that I did not commit this crime. All because he felt that I knew who had committed said murder and in his mind, I refused to cooperate with him and give him or supply him with information that can gain him a conviction against whoever I would have told him he had done it. So basically he's saying the prosecutor wanted him to snitch because he knew he knew who had done it. And because he would not assist this man with doing his own job, this man prosecuted him instead, knowing that he was innocent. And like I said, I had the paperwork. The prosecutor even goes so far to admit on record that he knows I did not commit this charge of murder but that I should receive a sentence of 45 years because I knew who had done the crime and instead chose to see murderers go free. This was stated to a judge 
who had labeled me a menace to society at the very beginning of my incarceration. Way before the case was decided or even any evidence was gathered that would prove this assertion to be true. No bond or bail was set, although they knew that I did not commit this crime. So I sat in the filthy DC city jail for two years before my trial even started. Here I sit 17 years later, still in prison, still innocent, yet in the same predicament because the justice system is lazy and wants us to do its duty and job for them. In fact, the system doesn't really care whether the men and women it convicts are actually guilty of the crimes that they are accused of. The only concern for the system is the percentage of the conviction rate and they go above and beyond to make sure the rate is very high. The sad thing about all of this is that these people go to great lengths to cram people in these prisons, which is obviously a big business, but refuse to offer any real or meaningful rehabilitating resources so that people come home and back out into society as productive citizens, not as ignorant, desperate, and criminal-minded people that went in originally. The only thing that jail offers you as it stands now is a way to think of becoming a better criminal. Why? Because for one, the only inmates to truly benefit from any program half-assed offered in the institution are the ones who are closest to the door. It's mostly book work, reading, and almost never hands-on demonstrating that would do more to lock in whatever curriculum or career skill it is the inmate is attempting to learn. Inmates with long sentences usually catch the bullcrap programs and if we do happen to luck up and get accepted to a worthwhile program, the surface knowledge is bare minimum and never enough or even taught well enough so that anything sticks after the course is over. This leaves most inmates feeling like attempting to program is a waste of time. And only a benefit to the institution for it, for it is the administration who looks good when the inmates sign up and complete programs to receive certificates. Pieces of paper that don't mean a damn thing in the free world. I mean, don't get me wrong, anyone can pick up a few things from a textbook, but the overall rehabilitation process is non-existent because the whole thing is a hoax. The prisons don't put forward any meaningful effort to help the inmates they house to become better people. So naturally, most of us figure out how to become better criminals. The condition of the prison itself is more than oftentimes poor and dirty. Sanitation is kept up by the inmate population as well as the maintenance and upkeep of the institution itself. So if things break down, in other words, we, the inmates, are expected to fix it unless whatever it is that needs fixing is not repairable. Then as a last resort, the institution will replace it. Hey, Seven. The inmates get sick on occasion, things like staph infections and other bacteria rashes that accompany the dirty prison setting. I begin to mention the numerous rules and policies that are violated by the officers and institution administration as a whole. They uphold and enforce these rules and policies when it benefits them, and they disregard them whenever they don't. He's saying police don't follow no fucking rules unless it's at a benefit to them. Other than that, there are no rules. Those of us who have determined a determined mind to do better in spite of our circumstances, we grow and mature, allowing the harsh conditions and the lack of resources to make us stubborn in our, in our determination to better ourselves. For example, before I was incarcerated, I had not gotten past the ninth grade. I wasn't slow or dumb, but my attention always shifted from school to trying to figure out how to make money. So when I was initially locked up, I had maybe an eighth grade education. And honestly, I still stuttered and stammered when I tried to read out loud. In fact, I had never even completed reading a book. In terms of me reading any novel from cover to cover, I guess in a sense, prison and the hardships of being in this place forced me to assess and really explore myself. In doing so, I found a lot of hidden talents that I probably would have never developed had I not gone through this ordeal. I developed into a prolific songwriter, R&B and rap, with piles of hit songs and material on deck just waiting to be heard by the world. 
and my quest to not be a burden on my family financially, I learned different ways to hustle. One hustle in particular was sewing and mending the clothing of the MA population. I developed an eye for creating my own clothing styles and designs, and this inspired me to create my own line. It's pretty dope, right? The clothing line, which I am now in the process of trying to get off the ground. I've also written several books, poetry books, short story books, and three thrillers. Of course, I have been through ups and downs of trying to get my work published. There are a lot of companies who prey on and try to exploit people who are incarcerated. After exploring a lot of dead ends, I finally came across a promising publishing situation slash relationship with Black Extension Publishing. Shout out to Black Extension. That's my folks. Founder Byron Bebo Dorsey. See BlackExtensionPub.com and Bout That Life Publications. Founder and author Daryl Bracey Jr. See his published titles Concrete Jungles and A Game for a Loss on the aforementioned website. The Black Extension website can be found on the From the Inside Out website and page. We share it all the time. These brothers who are housed in the same institution as I am, so now y'all know, they are also incarcerated doing big things, have been instrumental in me continuing to pursue my future career in writing. There were moments when prison got in the way and I sort of lost my drive and my passion. Now that my passion has been renewed due to me now having the opportunity to share my story with the world, um, now that I found passionate brothers like myself who understand my plight and believe in my worth, my future of becoming a published author is near the horizon, and I'm excited to see what I'm about to accomplish. What I'm able, excuse me, to accomplish. Be on the lookout for my first no type for my first novel titled "The Better Half: Conflicted Identity," which will soon debut. I was only able to develop into the man that I am because I was forced into a sink or swim situation and I chose to swim. I am literally the rose that grew from concrete and that is just not the case for most people who find themselves in this dark place. With that said, I'll say this. If you have friends or family members who are incarcerated, you should check on them and show that you still love and support them because at times we can feel abandoned and the feeling of being unloved and forgotten about can have a dramatic and negative effect on an incarcerated individual psych. Outside probing and support can also help improve the overall living conditions for the prisoners. After all, that is the key to us being able to transition successfully back out into society, which is the most important thing. Dante Kidd can receive support at Rivers Correctional Institution, PO Box 630, Winton, North Carolina, 27986. All right, you guys, thank you for watching. Per usual, you know, make sure you guys go support Prison from the Inside Out in Inc. Check the website out from dash the inside dash out.com, facebook.com forward slash from dot ti dot out, Instagram at from dot ti dot out. And Twitter at from the inside 01. I do want to just say in closing, you know, that um, Dante's story is a little bit um, different from the other stories that we share. I definitely did my research on this story before it came out, and everything that he's saying seems to be true. I 100% believe that this man is innocent, and we need to start taking heed to the fact that when these stories come out and these men are, men are saying that they're innocent right now. Every week, there are at least three people being exonerated. There are a lot of people who are incarcerated in California, in the United States in general, who are innocent all around the world. Let's just say all around the world who are innocent. So it's time to start coming together and standing up and really paying attention to the fact that there is an issue with our justice system. With that being said, I'm going to let y'all go, but make sure y'all go check out the website, click for support, donate. We always are accepting donations and funds. Bye, y'all.